Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. We're all grappling with the implications of the new Omicron variant of COVID. We published a bunch of notes this week on the topic, but by far our most popular offering has been our webinar with Professor Justin Stebbing of Imperial University, who gave us the lowdown on what we do and don't know about this new variant. You can watch the webinar on YouTube, or you can listen to it as a podcast on this channel. It's well worth a listen. And outside of COVID, we continue to enhance our research on crypto markets. We've now launched a new series of crypto indices that allow you to track the performance of different themes like the metaverse, DeFi, and smart contract platforms. It helps bring some order to the wild west of crypto. We also update our views on Ethereum. You can read all of this and more as a member of MacroHive, where you'll get access to our webinars, transcripts of podcasts, and crucially, our member Slack room, where the MacroHive team and members discuss markets all hours of the day. It's refreshingly different from Twitter. Membership to MacroHive costs the same as a few weekly cappuccinos, so go to macrohive.com to sign up. And if you're a professional or institutional investor, we have a more high-octane product that features all of my views, model portfolios, trade ideas, machine learning models, and much, much more. Hit me up on Bloomberg or email me on bilal at macrohive.com. That's bilal, B-I-L-A-L at macrohive.com. Now, on to this episode's guest, Fabio Natalucci. Fabio is Deputy Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the IMF. He's responsible for the Global Financial Stability Report that gives the IMF's assessment of global financial stability risks. And before the IMF, Fabio was a Senior Associate Director at the Federal Reserve Board. And between 2016 and 2017, Fabio was Deputy Assistant Director for International Financial Stability and Regulation at the US Department of Treasury. Now, on to our conversation. So greetings and welcome, Fabio, to the podcast show. I've been looking forward to our conversation. No, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, before we go into the meat of our conversation, I always like to ask our guests something about their origin story. So where did you go to university? What did you study? Was it inevitable you'd go into economics and policy making? And what was your journey to the IMF? So I grew up in Italy in a small town called Spoleto. Spoleto is famous for, it's called the Art Festival, called the Festival of Two Worlds, because it's like a sister city here in the US in Charleston and the Carolinas. And I grew up there through essentially high school. And like all teenagers, I want to get out from a small town in Italy. Spoleto is in Umbria, which is like the, the green heart of Italy. And so I, I was just counting the days to, <laughs> to leave and go to a big city. And so I went to undergrad to a private university in Rome it's called Lewis, and I did economics there. So in Italy, at least back then when I was a while ago, when I was younger, you had to pick in some sense a major where you were uh, when you were going to college. So I picked economics. There were a few e- couple of years where you essentially everyone has the same classes. Then you have to pick a specialization. And so I was indecisive until the last minute between finance and economics. And then somehow I ended up picking economics. One of the reasons was that I always loved history and philosophy. And so I thought I could do some of it by doing economics and studying like, I don't know, history of economic thoughts and that kind of stuff. Trying to you know, bridge the two, but history has always been my, one of my passions. So I did economics and it was more on the theory side. So like modeling and that kind of stuff. And so then from there, I had a bunch of young professors who had just done a PhD in the US. And so they encouraged me to apply for a PhD in the US. Honestly, I applied to way too many in retrospect, including because I have no clue where I was applying. So some places I picked them just because of ranking of the econ department. And then when I start receiving some of the acceptances. I just located them on the map and some of them (laughs) sound very appealing in some sense. And so I ended up going to New York Okay, very, a very scientific approach, I, I can tell. A very scientific, but the beginning was scientific, right? The ranking was scientific. And then locating on the map, it was just like, I was like, is anyone going to ever visit me from Italy? <laughs> there, no. So, okay, dropped. <laughs> so I ended up going to New York University, NYU. So I did a PhD there in economics, and my advisor was Mark Gertler, which turned out to be quite opportune in life because he was working with Ben Bernanke at that time. So I knew Ben from grad school. And also the, the, the stuff I was working with him and the end, in the ended up being the topics so of my, my thesis was the, essentially the role of financial markets in, if you want, amplifying shocks, right? So what's called a financial accelerator. And 
with all the caveats of a model, linear models, how you apply in life. But I think the framework of thinking the interaction between financial markets and real economic activity or real economy, I think this served me well when I then ended up working at the Fed. So I finished, I graduated, I started the Fed in Washington at the Federal Reserve Board. I started in international finance. I cover emerging markets at the beginning, emerging Asia and Eastern Europe. Then I moved to a small group called Domestic Banking, essentially studying the transmission channel monetary policy. And then in May 2007, because banking was quite boring, honestly, back then, nothing was happening in com- commercial banking. I decided I had this brilliant idea of moving to a little new group that was just created called Monetary and Financial Stability. And that was about two months before the financial crisis arrived. And then from there, that kind of defined my career because in the timing of writing academic papers kind of disappeared very quickly. And so I was thrown into the real world of trying to understand like, I don't know, what is a CDO? That, that unit became kind of like the residual group. Like if there was stuff that no one had any idea what that was, it was like, okay, go out and learn. And that kind of like, I don't know, shaped my career there. So then I got involved with discount window, the liquidity facilities, I ended up working on essentially interaction between monetary policy, financial stability, and financial regulation until 2016. In October 2016, I joined the U.S. Treasury as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability, International Financial Stability and Regulation. The idea was I was going to, that was like a, back then, there was a, a lot of work on financial regulation. And so the idea was to transition the outgoing Obama administration into a new administration particularly as it's retained to a G20 work on financial regulation stuff. Of course, I was called in by the Obama administration, so I suspect there was some expectation that there would be the incoming administration would be a democratic administration, which didn't happen. So I, I stay. I actually really enjoy working at Treasury. It was one of probably the best experience in my working life. I represented Treasury at the FSB. I did a bunch of work on financial stability, or financial markets, and the staffing was very thin. So you had much more exposure internally and externally that I think normally you would have. So personally, it was a fantastic experience. I love working at Treasury, and I left a lot of friends there. Then when my period expired, I had the choice either go back to the Fed or do something else. And it's kind of like the Fed is a very, it's a fantastic word, but it's very specific what you do. Treasury was the complete opposite, right? So it was 10, I don't know, the portfolio was huge, but you didn't have time to do a lot of analytical in-depth work, just there was no time. And so I, the IMF, I applied to the IMF and it felt like kind of in the middle in some sense. Analytical work, but more topics, more international, which is what I was doing at Treasury compared to the Fed. It felt, an, I don't know, the, the right time to go back to do international work. And so I, I applied to the, work, to the job here at the IMF as the deputy director in the monetary and capital markets. And what I do now, I essentially run one of the flagship, the Global Financial Stability Report, and I am responsible for global financial markets. So we have one person in New York, three in London, one in Hong Kong, one in Singapore, and produce a bunch of internal products like three, day, three a day. So in the morning out of London, 1 and 9 a.m. here in the U.S., and then closing of trading business in the U.S. So I spend most of my time essentially talking to private sector people like you, and that has become my job. So you can see from the pre-moving to the little unit when I was writing papers, what I do now, <laughs> there's been sort of a discontinuity. But it's been a fantastic experience, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's a great, it's a, it's a great story there. And you obviously got a lot of experience in different some of the sort of the biggest institutions in, in financial markets and the economy it's still funny like going back thinking of like when i was in high school in that little town i don't think i was planning to do this yeah it's quite quite a big change i was going to say that you know the work you've done on the global financial stability report has been really good one of the things i'm impressed by is just how you're communicating the message everything's snappier it's more accessible i think that's been really quite good work that you've done since you've taken over the helm of that report so we tried to do two things, right? When I came in, in some sense, the mandate was one, to provide a more formal analytical framework. And so what we have done, we have introduced this, what we call the, the growth and risk model, right? So we essentially try to separate shocks from financial condition, from financial vulnerabilities, from output. Shock, honestly, I don't want to be in the business of forecasting shocks. You can go back to the October 2019 GFSR, and obviously pandemic was not something we were thinking of, right? So I forecasting the future is really, I don't think, where my value added is. But what we can do once the shock hit, we can track how that impact financial conditions, right? So we have a bunch of indices. We look at components across this so that you can actually identify different kinds of shocks that have different impact on the components. 
we can monitor financial vulnerabilities, whether this is asset valuation or whether this is financial vulnerabilities like leverage, liquidity, interconnectness, because those become the amplifier of the shock, right? Shock hit, financial condition tighten, and then you have this amplifier. They magnify the impact. And then we, in terms of output, we look at the full GDP distribution and the left tail, so the downside risk. And that's our quantitative measure of financial stability risk. So that was kind of like introducing this framework that would allow us to compare every six months where the financial stability risk were, how they evolved, and also allows to track the financial vulnerabilities. Those are the medium-term vulnerabilities. They are some of them structural and allows us to make sure the financial system is able to absorb shocks as opposed to becoming amplified. So that was one the mandate. I think the other one was to, as you said, to get messages out in a snappy way. That was something I had to learn. The Fed, the most successful performance of the Fed when you do minutes or FOMC statement is like you don't move markets, right? And you're like an invisible bureaucrat if you want. You don't go out, you don't give speeches, you're not on social media. So learning to do that, to do the press conference, which is a live event with like, I don't know, at least when we're in person with 100 plus journalists in the room, when you do write blog, when you do podcasts like here, when you do TV interviews, that was something that the Fed honestly did not <laughs> prepare me for. And so they were very good here. They make me take some classes. You have advice from communication people. And that has become a big part of, I think, how do we communicate? And part is because we are not a central bank, right? We don't set interest rates. So the way we communicate the message is the narrative to have a story. So having a story is crucial here. And then also being able to reach different audiences, right? Not just central bankers, not just Wall Street, but also a broader audience. A broader audience requires different tools with different parts of the audience. So we spend quite a bit of time in terms of thinking about messaging, the visual of the messaging, and how to do it. So that was, I think, the other part of the mandate. I think it's been great, great work on all, on all those fronts. And your most recent report, which came out in October, so it had a nice catchy subtitle, COVID, crypto, climate, three Cs, which I thought was quite apt you know, in terms of three big topics for this year. And perhaps you could start with COVID and maybe look back a bit, as well as having some sense of, we, we're obviously in the middle of Omicron and we'll see what, what that means. But once the pandemic unfolded, and obviously we've had about a year and a half now, just coming up to two almost, what happened that was expected based on your framework and what was unexpected, given if you were told about the shock? And so we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand how this shock was different, right? And so the obvious comparison is always the GFC, right? Because it's close to us and because some of us were involved with that crisis. So it's an obvious, I don't know, it's almost like a, a comfort zone, right? It's easy to go there where you're more familiar. And so thinking about the comparison, for example, the shocks itself is different, right? So the GFC was a financial shock, right? Hit the banking system in the US at the core of the financial system, propagated to the periphery of the US financial system, then to the rest of the world. This is a real shock. Like it's pandemic originated somewhere else in the world, but still became a global shock because it propagated to the rest of the world. So different shock implies different transmission channel, implies affecting different potential vulnerabilities. The second difference was the response by central banks in terms of like timing, much faster, obviously, than the GFC. We have a chart on global financial conditions. You see the spike very quickly, but it also come down very quickly. Not only faster, but also the magnitude was larger, right? Central bank cut rates very fast. They start doing asset purchase very fast. They set up liquidity facility, look at the Fed, right? They redid the entire playbook of the GFC plus, right? They went into credit and a bunch of other stuff, but very quickly, very massively. And that was very effective. The third piece was, and that was the big difference, I think, with the GFC, the fiscal policy played a large role here. And that was the missing part in some sense, right? Even the Obama administration fiscal pact back there was much smaller compared to what has been done here, not just in the US, but globally, even in emerging markets. And so that makes us think about the pandemic in a different way. And so without looking through the lenses of this, you could, if you go back and you say, okay, what would be, you can imagine that you forecast the equity markets would be depressed for a while, that the credit cycle, there would be spike in the fourth. And we did all that. And we have forecasts and looking at where, I don't know, spreads, how wide could be, what the default rates would be. But clearly they played out differently. And he played the reason why we were able to get out the global economy out from that hole, I think is because of the policy response both fiscal, monetary, and also financial policies, right? Some of the relaxation of some of the financial regulatory rules and use. And, and on the policy response, I mean, what one debate, I guess, is still kind of, is still ongoing is, could we have had a response where interest rates were not cut so much, and we didn't necessarily have QE, but we had some kind of 
backstop of the financial system and we had a large fiscal stimulus. So if, if we had not pulled all of the levers, do, do you think that, that could have worked? So I don't know what is the optimal policy mix, honestly. I, I think it depends on the country, right? There's two considerations, I think. One, advanced economies obviously have more policy space for fiscal policy. And they have used it, you can see, they have used it, right? not just the US, look at Europe, look at the UK, other countries. For emerging markets, that's less so an option, right? So the policy mix is different, but structurally different. The second reason, I think, to go in the order that the, different, the country have gone, like monetary policy, rates, asset purchases, and then fiscal policy, is because central bank can respond immediately, right? They can have a meeting today, cut zero, announce asset purchases. Fiscal policy, that is a legislative process. You need to find partisan or bipartisan approach if you can think about how you want to allocate the money. So it's a much lengthier process. This is why the signaling approach, I think, of monetary policy is so powerful because you can step in immediately. And even in before you actually start, you look at the Fed, you start getting impact on credit markets even before they even set up the facility. And it's just the announcement effect. And that's something that only central banks can do. They're never going to be able to do fiscal policy. But having fiscal policy allowed, in some sense, will then hand over all the responsibilities, right? So you can find the right policy mix where perhaps rates don't have to stay as low as long as otherwise without fiscal policy. So I think that makes a huge difference. Now, it filled into the debate on inflationary pressure, how much this is driven by fiscal policy or not, right? And you can debate at length. But I think personally that the response is the right response. The, the first thing you want to do, I grew up in an environment where I grew up in terms of career. The first thing you do, you put the fire down. And then you start thinking about other issues. Yeah, and I guess ex post, you know, when when the fires settle down, it's easy to be nitpicky and say, oh, this particular thing they shouldn't have done in this. But in the heat of the moment, it was hard to say. I mean, the, the other thing that was surprising was just the lack of bankruptcies and defaults. I mean, were, were you surprised about that or not? I honestly, yes, in the sense that if you asked me like a year ago, we were all thinking about where defaults would go, how bankruptcy would be widespread, particularly for SMEs, right? Large companies are always trickier because once the Fed or the central bank step in, they reopen markets, those who have access to markets. And that's what they did. They took advantage of reopening of markets. They rebuilt liquidity buffer. They fixed their balance sheet and large companies can do that. The issue that I think the concern was more for the lower rated companies, obviously, I yield, because it took longer for those markets to reopen, including emerging markets. Right? Emerging markets follow the same pattern, right? So it reopened later and then reopened with IG and then I yield. And then the concern was for the those who don't have access to markets and they are more bank dependent, for example, like SMEs. So I think that's where the lot of concern was, including because a big chunk of the employment is generated by SMEs, even in the US, right? A surprise to learn what share of employment in fact is generated, even the US is generated by SMEs. But that's where the concern was. And I think, again, that's where fiscal policy helped, right? Because monetary policy, there's less that can do for those. Reopening markets is great for a listed company. It's less obvious for mom and pop firm that you can actually benefit from that. And that's why I think some of the fiscal measures help because they kept some of these SMEs alive. Now, of course, the bet has always been all this is going to be a bridge to a recovery, right? So we can we throw every fiscal fiscal monetary policy tools we have and we hope the recovery restart quickly so then that we can hand over to the regular economic activity. That's where the bet was, and I think the bet turned out to be effective. The SMEs, there is still a difference though between say the US and, and Japan versus Europe, right? So we have seen the bankruptcy coming down across the board, firm size in the US and sectors, similar pattern in Japan. In Euro, in, in Euro the, the bank bankruptcy for SMEs has not come down as much as this year. In fact, has, has continued to increase. Different reason, right? You can think of like, I don't know, the f- different policy mix. You can think because they're more bank dependent, they have less access to market because the recovery has been lagging relative to others. And there's a lot of different interpretation. But as a fact, and that was a chart I think we had in the GFSR showing that the bankruptcy, in fact, have not come down in Europe as much as in the US. And in terms of the business cycle right now, I mean, how would you characterize it in terms of the recovery? It, it seems like we have had this handoff, as you've said, you know, there, there's been a noticeable improvement in the labor market, wages are picking up, if anything, there's signs of overheating with inflationary pressures. So how would you characterize where we are in the cycle right now? Yeah, so maybe I'll start one, one last thing that I forgot to mention before, which is important. Another reason I think why the recovery perhaps has been faster in the US because there is also a distressed debt market, right? So some of these company also managed to get funding in distressed debt. Now you pay up, obviously the yield you pay, whether you do through 
prefer equity or you fall through senior loans, it's expensive, but it's a, it's an option, right? You don't have to shut down. And then I think give you another, I don't know, another bridge to the recovery. The business cycle, maybe one way to think about it is the credit cycle, right? So it looks like this credit cycle is very elongated, right? You don't, doesn't seem to have followed the pattern that you normally would follow. And that goes back to the bankruptcy not materializing and defaults coming down. And so the true question there to me is, how much is this elongated credit cycle is due to the fact that there is policy support? And what will happen to this policy, to this credit cycle once policy support is removed? There was a lot of focus on, for example, the banking sector, right? So a lot of fiscal measures, including moratoria and credit guarantee, right? So what would happen to banking behavior once this policy support is removed? Would they become more conservative? Would they land into the recovery? And that's where we're paying attention quite a bit now because I think it's going to shape, again, it's going to give you a good sense of what the shape of the recovery is in terms of credit. And at this stage, I suppose it, it's too early to say. They just started to remove. I mean, there was, a, if I remember correctly, like an ECB a bank lending survey coming out. I think there was encouraging sign of, of demand picking up that shows that credit would follow with the recoveries. We'll continue to support. And this is a big difference, again, with the GFC. Banks have not been the source of the problem. In some sense, have been part of the solution so far. The issue is what we'll do as we uh, start to remove the support. Will they jump in and continue to provide support? More banking-centric in Europe, more capital markets in the US. Perhaps it's a slightly different discussion. In terms of the recovery, I think we're going through an interesting assessment of what is the impact of these waves of, of pandemics, right? So we saw we COVID, alpha, through the alphabet soup, and now we Omicron. And so trying to understand, I think, three pieces of this maybe focusing on Omicron, for which we don't know much. So we are in complete speculation now, but maybe that's why it's fun. One, would it be the impact on demand, right? Would it be a drag on demand or not? And you can learn something looking back at the Delta and the other variants. It looks like that the impact, the economic impact of this is progressively getting shorter. And you can see market reaction too, right? When the news comes out, you get this drop in risk assets, but they recover very quickly. So if the pandemic follows the same pattern, that's something that at least we can look back at and learn from there. Now, condition on two things. One is what is the actual virus evolution, right? For example, will it take over like Delta did and become the main variant out there or not? And two, condition importantly, what the vaccine effectiveness will be. I think the diminishing impact on the variants has been predicated in part, at least, on the vaccine being out there. The vaccinated hospitalization rates down less impact on mobility, at the same time, the sensitivity of economic activity to mobility being, being lower. So will it follow the same pattern or not? I think those are just questions at this point for which we don't have answer. The second piece of the, on the table is the impact on inflation. And I think it gets trickier here in the sense that we can see what we have learned from the past on in this different variant, but we also are at a stage where inflationary pressure have risen. Right. And so what are the impact now when we already have supply bottleneck, right? What happens if, I don't know, producer in Asia, for example, is shut down or if there are lockdown measures there? That could become an amplifier of this bottleneck. And so the expectation that the bottleneck will go away over time, and that's something to consider. What will be ultimately the impact on inflationary pressure? And there seems to be two ways in market. I have one more benign, which is, okay, maybe this is going to slow down demand. It's going to take some pressure on the supply side, and so the inflationary pressure may actually lessen. Or, because this is coming at a time when inflationary pressure is so high, this, even though even if demand slows, it will amplify inflationary pressure, unless it's a real hit on the recovery, which we all don't want that to happen. Then the third piece of this is, what does it mean for monetary policy? Right? We are at a very unique juncture, at least in advanced economies, where there is discussion ongoing on normalization, tapering the time of the first hike and we have seen in the US and the UK in the RBA among various advanced economies. So what will be the impact of that debate at this point coming out of Omicron? So those are the three lenses I think we, at least I'm trying to look to what I talk to people or try to learn as much as I can. Like the demands impact on inflation, what it means for monetary policy at this point. And just on inflation, obviously, this has been a big heated sort of discussion. There's been big debates around transitory or not, and how do you define all of this? You know, I suppose one definition of transitory is that inflation doesn't go back to 2% in the next, say, 12 months or so. So over the course of 2022, there should be an expectation that inflation should 
in the US and Eurozone start to go back down to 2%. And, and also, you know, inflation shouldn't broaden out to all sectors. At the moment, there's a very heavy concentration in, in commodity-related sectors of CPI or inflation and, and goods, but it hasn't really spread out that, that sort of dramatically. I mean, how, how, how do you sort of define sort of transitory or, or not? Or is this like a silly debate to have? To be honest, I never like the definition transitory versus permanent for one reason, because as an ex-central banker, I know what central banks mean by transitory, right? They look at their forecast. Right? If you look at the forecast of the Fed, they have TC at 2. Point, I forgot the exact number, but 2.2, 2.2, let's say, for 2022, and then core at 2.3, right? So by that standard, you could argue that it's temporary, right? It overshoots at 4 plus percent and then comes back at the end of 2022. The problem is, like, if you pe- to, to people in markets like you, I would argue that one year, it sounds much less temporary than maybe it sounds to a central banker, right? Then if you talk to a person that is going food shopping, 12 months is a long time to have elevated prices, right? So I, I never like the use of those words because it means too many, the, the meaning is so different to different people that I'm not sure it helps the communication from a policy standpoint. Now, of course, it could turn out to be not so permanent, right? There are a number of assumptions predicated baked into that that is not going to really fit into the underlying dynamics. And so there is a nice handover between goods, inflation to services. And so bottleneck at some point go away. At that time, people switch spending from goods to services. And one component comes down when the other component goes up. And on average, you start seeing some decline. There's somehow an assumption so that is not essentially broadening up to various components of, of inflation indices. That it doesn't fit into inflation dynamic, the wage dynamics too much. So it doesn't get entrenched into the, the, the wage discussion. And then three, importantly for central banks, that the long-term inflation expectations don't get the anchor, right? They don't move away from the, from the target. That's where all the debate is, like how much has broadened beyond goods to services? Have we seen this end over or not? How much the wage pressure are in specific sectors that were affected by the pandemic or much broader than that? And there seems to be signs that they are broadening the inflationary pressure and the wage pressure seems to be broadening. Now, on the long-term inflation expectation, I don't think that there's not many signs so far of the anchoring of those. The signs you get from markets are more mixed, perhaps, right? So if you look at the inflation break-evens, for example, here in the US or Europe, yeah, they have rebounded, as you would expect, right? You were in a hole from an economic standpoint, so you would expect a rebound. Part of it was amplified by liquidity issue. So rebounding it comes with the recovery. There have been commodity prices increase, energy and other component of the commodity complex. So some increase in the front end of the zero to five years is, is suspected. No much signs of the anchoring so far. The break-even forward rates is declining. It's downward sloping, which means market expect inflation eventually to come down. I think where you get more concern is perhaps on the options market, where if you look at the caps and floor, the distribution, particularly in the US and the UK, seems to assign a significant, not significant, but mi- meaningful mass on inflationary outcome above three percent perhaps that's a more i don't know concerning sign investor clearly seems to be focused on this right? if you look at the flows here in the us into tips fund they've been strong so clearly they're at an attempt at least to hedge future possible future inflation outcome and on the inflation expectation side there was a paper by the fed on how inflation expectations aren't as important for the formation of inflation obviously that's just one view i mean do, do you have a view on on inflation expectations as a important channel for inflation? Personally, I think they matter. We can debate whether they get extracted from market signal through different specific sophisticated models, whether we're putting too much emphasis on assumptions or not. But there are different ways to look at it. Right? You can look at surveys, you can look at other measures. I, I think what central bank care is that the long term, and you can define long term however you want, that they are not really moving away from their inflation targeting number, like right? from that 2% or whatever the number is from from central bank. And the concern is that because if that happens, then it fits back into the wage dynamics, for example, right? So if your expectation of price moving higher, then you start asking for higher wages. And that fits. Now, it's much looser link between wage inflation and price inflation because, for example, there's no indexation, right? So the impact of prices and wages is not direct. It used to be in the, I don't know, the 70s, for example. Personally, I think the inflation expectation do matter. I mean, that's just my own view. And then I guess also there's also for wages to inflation, there's also a question of productivity, I suppose, as well, if you think about things in unit labor cost terms. Yeah. And so the concern to me, if you want to be concerned about productivity, you look at the real rates here in the US, right? So you have the 
five year I had almost two, minus 200 basis points. And even the 30 year, I was just looking at yesterday, it was almost like minus 50 basis points. If you use that as a proxy for where market thinks potential growth could be, then I think we are in trouble. So hopefully those measures are somewhat distorted by market liquidity and the Fed buying into the tips market, because that's a little depressing view of what long-term productivity of an economy is. Uh, if you take those. I mean, the, the other side of the equation has been in terms of what we've seen over the past year is just asset price inflation. So obviously, we've seen equity markets have done incredibly well, especially you know the US equity market. We've seen housing prices go up a lot. Now, is is that a concern for you in terms of stability, financial stability or, or not? How do, you, how do you think about asset price inflation? So we have, again, going back to the framework we have, right? We have shock, financial condition, then vulnerabilities. And we switch, the, we divide the vulnerabilities between asset valuation and structural vulnerabilities, right? Like leverage, liquidity. Asset valuation play a role in the following sense, right? Suppose there is a shock, financial condition tighten. If equity markets are way higher than fundamental values, then the, the adjustment they need to go through to go move back to our fundamental is larger. Right? And so that larger move has an impact, obviously, on economic activity, it makes funding costs, higher borrowing costs, and so on. So we run a bunch of models on, for say, equity markets. Now, all those models now will tell you, with very few exceptions, that equity prices are, the, 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 the gap between current valuation and fundamental value is quite large. I like to run of this. One of the drivers of this is that earnings, uh, the, that considering the uncertainty if you want, about future earnings, valuation are too high. That's one way to put it. There is so much uncertainty about the economic outlook, the valuation should be lower. That's one important driver of the misalignment. I would take this with some grain of salt in the sense, and I think they're very helpful qualitatively. On the specific number, you always have questions about how good this model can do to incorporate the unconventional policies, right? Not just the negative rates, but the asset purchases, the signaling impact, and so those are very hard to formalize from a, an econometric standpoint. So I, I like to look at those from a qualitatively, whether the S&P is overvalued X or Y, honestly, I have the luxury now having to put money on that. <laughs> so <laughs> it provides important signal, I think, the way we think about it. But again, quantifying the impact of policy is something that it's particularly, it's particularly difficult in this model. And we can do some similar exercise with like corporate bond spreads, for example, right? How much of this is driven by... The level of rates, how much is driven by risk appetite. One thing to say of all this stuff, though, is that take equity for a minute, right? So think about the equity prices as the discount, future discount value, a bunch of future earnings, right? So one of the reasons why I think evaluation are so high is because the, the real discount factor, the real rates are so negative that in some sense, that seems to trump any little change over time in the, your expectation of earnings, right? And so, and this is where I think in terms of thinking how effective policies has been, they provide such a strong magnet in terms of like discounting of future earnings that if you have the five-year minus 200 basis point, obviously valuation are elevated, right? There's nowhere else to put money in some, in other sense, in, 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 in other words, right? And so, yes, eventually central bank will normalize, they will taper, they will move rate. But the backdrop remains still a very, very accommodative stance of policy and a huge amount of liquidity. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, risk assets seem to be uh, so, in, so far at least, resistant. And you mentioned the structural side, leverage and so on. How does that fit into the equation? So those become another amplifier. Right? So if you need to adjust, say the S&P needs to adjust by 15%, I'm just making up a number, that would be amplified, the drop in terms of speed and magnitude if, for example, investors are using leverage, right? Because then you get the typical deleveraging processes, margin call, liquidation of collateral, and so on. So the combination, if you want, of the two, the overvaluation or misalignment with the use of leverage, for example, make the adjustment much more abrupt and potentially also overshooting the, uh, the adjustment. That's how we look at this. And leverage is one. Of course, we look at liquidity issue, like mutual funds and liquidity was the big theme during. And how does it look at the moment, that side of it? Right. So we think that banks are, are doing relatively well. They came into the crisis with high level of capital, quality and level of capital and liquidity. So I, I think banks are worth position. Where we have seen it, we have highlighted vulnerability and we have a box that we have, we have a radar map, if you want, of vulnerabilities. Where we look at vulnerabilities are primarily in the sovereign sector, obviously. We have seen large deficit increase in public debt. We have seen some improvement in non-financial firm sector, 
right? They, have, they rebuilt their liquidity buffer, some of the net leverage is coming down. Also continue to see the vulnerabilities in the non-bank financial intermediation, so what we call the NBFI sector. Lots of focus has been on the asset management industry, particularly open-ended fund during the pandemic. And that's where we continue to put some attention. We have an interesting box. We look at the life insurance, for example, and what will happen if rates move higher and how much of a hit in a particularly inflationary environment would be for, for these firms. And then, of course, we do the same exercise. This is at the global level. Then we do the same exercise at the country level, right? The differentiating between advanced economies and emerging markets. So you can get, say, for country, I don't know, United States, you can look across these different sector where we see vulnerabilities and how they have changed. And how does the US look on, on that side? So the US we see in terms of like quantized, so ranking, if you want, over time, we see vulnerabilities in the sovereign because there's been a significant buildup of, uh, on the financial side. We see banking, they're doing very well. We see some vulnerability increase in the insurance sector, as I mentioned. And so then relatively elevated in the other non-bank financial intermediation sector. And how does China look on that metric? So China, we have highlighted a number of vulnerabilities, particularly in the non-financial corporate sector, in the household sector, increase in house prices, particularly and borrowing. And also, I think the big difference is on the bank sector. I think we are the vulnerability, we assess them to be more elevated, elevated in, the, in, in the Chinese banking sector, more so than, than other jurisdictions. It's not necessarily the largest big state bank, but it's the distribution of banks that we look at, particularly the smaller banks with particularly geographical location, perhaps more exposure to weaker parts of the country, and look at the inter essentially the interconnectedness between those smaller banks, local governments, and corporates, and particularly through the lenses of state-owned enterprise. And how are you looking at China more generally? Of course, you know, we've had clampdown on the real estate sector. There's been some restrictions in the tech sector. So it, it seems like China is trying to deleverage the economy actively. And obviously, there's some unexpected outcomes as well. But it seems quite an active policy to try to delever the economy, which is then associated with lower growth. And then there could be a potential spiral here where growth is too low, which means they have to pull back. And so there's, there's some uncertainty at the moment. I mean, how are you looking at China? So from a policy recommendation standpoint, we have made this point consistently over time that, that we have supportive of the authorities attempt to reduce financial leverage in the financial sector. Shadow banking, so wealth management product, and other corner of the system. So we have been supportive. We continue to be supportive of that. There is the issue of Evergrande and the property developers. And we have a box in the GFSR where we try to walk the reader through possible channels. I think the assessment was that contagion risks were relatively limited, although there was some intensification of the stress beyond individual names. Obviously, the authorities have the tools to step in and take action and fix both the financial sector fragilities as well minimize the impact on the economy. And we try to, to frame the trade of the policymaker frame in terms of policy choices, in terms of how much to intervene and intertemporal choice, right? So you can take targeted measures to support specific institutions or support the economy more broader. You can intervene today or you can wait a little longer if you are in still market discipline. That's a trade-off in terms of magnitude, extent of measure and instead of timing that I think they're facing. How much you want to do and how when do you want to do that? You can still in discipline vis-a-vis -vis potentially having some unintended consequences if you wait too long. That's how we were trying to frame. We have we identify essentially three channels of transmission of, of stress. One is the, through the domestic financial sector. Again, from the property developer to other sector, right? We have seen pressure in dollar funding, offshore dollar funding markets, just even beyond the property developer, right? So to the high yield market, they lead to some investment grade. And so one is the exposure of banks, right? What is the exposure of banks to the sector? Not necessarily at the aggregate level, but also like, is there a weak tail of banks that are exposed to the sector? The second one is the exposure of the, the uh, non-bank financial institution, right? So whether this is well management product, whether this is trust fund, trust loans, trust funds, trust companies. And then the interconnectedness between these NBFIs in the banking sector itself and the contingent guarantees that some of the CMA offer. For example, guarantee on wealth management products that they have offered. Then there is the domestic, more macro channel, the traditional channel, right? So uh, real estate is like, I don't know, a fifth, a qu uh, sorry, a quarter of the GDP when you put it together. So if house price declines, sell price goes down, those are important revenues for local government. What is the impact on the global macroeconomy? And then feedback into the, the financial sector and tightening of financial conditions. 
And then the third channel is the international channel, right? Both through some global risk appetite channel, as we saw in September, through the offshore dollar funding markets, so provisioning of dollars, and more broadly, the inclusion of China into global indices, right? Both equity and fixed income indices, and what's the exposure of the large, for example, asset management names in the industry through China, through that channel. You can do some work on Bloomberg. There are some information available, so who the names are, and we try to do that to come up with some quantitative number. But only a fraction of that is actually reported there. So you just give a glimpse, essentially, to at least to give an assessment qualitatively how the, how the channel could work. That, that's where we were on the property developer challenges. Now, of course, we need to see what Omicron does at the not just to China, but to the global economies as well, right? One of the concerns, again, is that an amplification of this bottleneck and supply chain issue, especially if you go down into lockdown again. Different jurisdictions have taken different approaches in terms of vaccine versus lockdown, but paying close attention whether this would become an additional strain on the supply chain. And I wanted to sort of pivot to crypto, because I know that the IMF in the Global Financial Stability Report, you're focusing a bit more on crypto. I mean, from kind of a very high level, what's the kind of the good and the bad of crypto from your perspective? Yeah, so we try to frame it in a way First of all, to provide like a descriptive description of the ecosystem, right? The crypto asset ecosystem. Try to differentiate between, I don't know, specific crypto asset ecosystem as like Bitcoin or some of those vis-a-vis -vis stable coin, make clarity on the differences there. What kind of microfinancial stability issue there might be, for example, with stable coin. And then take the angle of emerging markets, right? Should some of the emerging market countries adopt any of these crypto assets, what would be, would be the issue? Uh, there was less of an interest in taking this, this particularly so strong view on valuations. I think we tried to do that in the past. We did it about two years ago, three years ago. Uh, back then when we did, we did a bunch of like, I don't know, correlations. And the interesting point was that the correlation were low with other asset classes. And the return adjustable volatility. That's what we look at sharp ratio, essentially. I think this issue of correlation has increased now. The correlation is relatively higher with other asset classes. So, and of course, they were smaller before, they are much larger now. But much the, the chapter is really not about taking a stand on valuation themselves. It's more like, for, for example, on stablecoin, taking a view on it's important to know what's in the what the basket the reserve is composed of, right? Do they resemble are they raising issues related to the money fund industry that we are all aware of back in the GFC and some of the strains we have seen more recently? What kind of reserve they are? What is backing that? How transparent they are? And could that become like a sort of run issue like we have seen with money market funds? With the extra layer of, of concern is that if these are used as payment system within the payment system could become another channel. That could be another channel of amplification of stress. And do you think the the current state of the stablecoin market does pose a risk that we need to consider, or is it just too small right now? No, I think it is relatively small. But the issue is like how fast this is going to get bigger, and so really how and how stable are the stablecoin, and so what are the behind the reserve, and so information on that, more clarity, more transparency, and make sure. So with the, we had a chart that was interesting, looking at the backing of some of the names. So without necessarily naming specific stablecoins, but one of them had essentially almost 100% in cash, bank deposit, and treasury bills. And then another one had about a third in those. And then a big chunk was commercial paper and corporate bonds and Yankee CDs. Those are not necessarily as liquid, right? It's bank deposit. And so can you convert it instantly? And how much, importantly, again, how much transparency there is? How much do we know what is there being held? Is that audited, verified? And so... What kind of approach in terms of like financial regulation should be taken? An additional point to make, again, where I said this, this is a global phenomenon, right? And so one thing to avoid is fragmentation, not just of markets, but also fragmentation of regulatory responses. So the need for cooperation and possibly some sort of global standard. I think that would be helpful in this world. And the other big topic is climate. And there's lots of different ways one can look at sort of climate. But I suppose the fundamental one is, do we have the right amount of investment in renewables and alternative energy sources or not? And how does one go about getting that investment? So the, the big question here is like, how can you get to net zero? say by 2050, what kind of investment do you need? And the numbers has different estimates, so I don't need to pick one, but the numbers are huge, right? And so it seems obvious to me that the public sector cannot provide that scale of investment by itself. So there's clearly a role, an important role for private finance. And so how do we incentivize private finance to actually contribute? 
to net zero 2050 and what all can they play? So we had a chapter where we look at a subset of private finance, which is the investment fund sector and how that sector in terms of risk and opportunities, but in terms of how can you contribute? So we look at this, we had a database and quite interestingly of about 150 trillion of total asset under management. We look at how much of that it's sustainable finance or ESG. That was about 3.6 trillion at the end of 2020. But if you narrow down to what are just climate funds, that was a very small number. It was 130 billion, which is like 0.3% of that. So tiny, right? So it's growing fast, but clearly there's a need to scale that up rather rapidly if you really want private finance to contribute. Then we try to look at like what role can they play? What are the positives? And I think we highlight three. One is that from a financial stability perspective, it seems to be that investors in these funds are less running, fewer, less sensitive to returns, right? So probably maybe because they have medium term objective, they don't respond as quickly to up and down of prices. So that could be a mitigation factor in terms of financial stability risk. And then they can play two roles. One in terms of providing financing to green projects. And we find evidence essentially that they encourage issuance of securities by firms with a more sus- uh, favorable sustaining rating. So essentially, they provide financing for the development of renewable energy. The second part that I think they can play a role in terms of, of investor stewardship. And so essentially, they seem to be more keen to support climate-related resolution. And so they seem to support the adoption of renewable energy or clean energy. So I think overall, those were good signs. Now, is there an issue here in terms of how do you scale it up? What needs to be done? One interesting finding was that the labels matter. So we tried to control for a bunch of other factors like ESG scoring, performance. In the end, even if you control for that, labels are still a decisive factor, deciding factor for investors, which is a good thing in some sense, but it's also raised a number of issues, which is we need to make sure then that what is labeled as green is actually green, right? Avoid greenwashing. What measure can be taken to improve the availability of quality data or comparable data across jurisdiction? How do we make sure that we have some classification so that the markets are not climate classification to avoid fragmentation of markets and then standards? And I think there's been quite a bit of progress going into COP26 on this, which is after we published. But on the, I don't know, the IFRS Foundation, the, the announcement on the International Sustainable Standard Boards, a lot of work being done now on this classification. For example, we're doing work with the World Bank and the OECD to come up with some principles. And then on the data side, I co-chair NGFS or Network for Green, the financial system, work stream on closing the climate data gap. So I'm looking at data use and data availability, what can be done to make data available to stakeholders. So I think there's a lot of progress. But again, it's an important point because if investors do get attracted by labels, we want to make sure that those labels represent essentially what is being sold to them. And so that firms can be essentially accountable for what they are committing to. Yeah, and that's very true. Yeah. I mean, it seems like in Europe, they're making some quite big moves in this direction with the taxonomy and some penalties for greenwashing and so on. So maybe that will be kind of an example for, for the rest of the world. I mean, in terms of investment, I was just thinking if there's a climate crypto coin, that would surely attract like a trillion dollars just like that. The other thing that's interesting, like I follow that closely until lately, it's not just listed companies, right? So even like private markets here in the US, like private equity, private debt, the role of ESG or sustainable finance is growing quite rapidly. And so same issue there, though, right? how to make sure that there is transparency, availability of information. I think that there's no way to get to 2050 without the invest the, the role played by the private sector, the private, private finance. And so how to make sure that we get the best out of it, how we set the rules in place for transparency, accountability, and so on. I think that's a big, a big job for us in terms of and then the private sector needs to do what the private sector only can do which is provide financing in the right places the right prices uh, as much as possible now i did want to round up our conversation with a few personal questions you know one i always like to ask is how do you manage your informational research flow because i know you have to keep on top of economic news financial news you have to you provide all these daily updates quarterlies and so on i mean what do you have a system or what, what's your approach i mean the main driver to me that i love following markets and so i mean i would read everything that's out there so my Phone here, I have essentially every possible information you can have from Brug, Wall Street Journal, FT, The Economist, and you go down the list of access. So we have a bunch of like industry publications. So I try to read as much as I can, including various social media. The risk is always overflow. Like you read too much and then you at the end of the day, you're like, well, what did I read today? And so I try to, I don't know, usually when I think of which I, the Omicron is a good example, right? Try to, before I start reading 
the amount of stuff is available out there every day, try to think about what is the, what are the questions I'd like to get some answer today. And so I have, I don't know, two, three questions that I think uh, help me think about these issues. Like Omicron was the main impact of economic activity, inflation policy. And then when I read stuff, I tend to categorize the stuff based on like, I don't know, the buckets of questions I had. There's so much information out there. So there's a need to, for first of all, distinguish good quality information from poor quality information. But even within the good quality information, then like how are they relevant to you, right? You don't, otherwise you just spend the day reading. And so this is why I try to have in mind some, I don't know, what, what, what would I like to learn when I read, I spend my next 12 hours reading or interacting with people. And I try to just like as much as I can link what I learned to what the question I had and I'm trying to answer. Now I'm oversimplifying, obviously, but the, the other thing is, I think to be open-minded, there's often you don't ask the right question, meaning you're not thinking the right thing you should ask him. And so being open-minded and thinking, I'm like, okay, maybe I'm not asking the right question here. I should be asking something else. And that the, the last thing is like to talk to as many people as possible. I think that's the only way to shape your views. Otherwise, you go into the confirmation bias that you just ask people what you want to hear and that reinforce your views. And, and I think being open-minded, that was one big lesson during the financial crisis 10 plus years ago. Yeah, I agree with all of those things, actually. It's, I think it's, it's really important to... Yeah, think about questions. So you have at least some filter where you get to all the information of that. And you're right, changing the question as well is helpful. The other thing is not getting stuck into like, there's a tendency to not admit that you made a mistake, right? Or you're not interpreting the right way. And you just double down and keep digging. And so at some point you have to cut losses and move on, right? And so that, that's hard to do because you need to admit that you were wrong. But I think it's important. And the information you get every day that helps because you can you can recalibrate there's never going to be the perfect piece of news that is going to make change your mind right? you need to be i don't know humble and nimble enough i think to just adjust your position as you learn more and and you mentioned you like reading i mean are there any books that have really influenced you over your career or anything you read recently that you would recommend to others so one book that i love reading and it was part of my moving away from i don't know being an, an writing paper and being more academic and being thrown into the real life was the barbarians at the gate on the <laughs> because I really start when I start reading I realized a couple of, one is like how human psych- psychology it makes a huge difference right and it's a, an important driver that is not something at least when I went to grad school was really top of the list of the things you would learn in those classes and also because I think I realized that I need to get out of the building and learn more <laughs> how the, the real world the financial sector work and so that one book that always struck me it also, that sector, like the, lever- the LBOs, the leverage buyout, leverage finance, it's a sector I was always been fascinating. I think it's an, really an important barometer of risk taking and greed and where the state of financial markets are. And I continue to follow the market through the financial crisis. Ten years ago, I, I was following leverage finance, the institutional side of leverage finance and the LBOs. And I, I remember the Fed sent me to New York to learn more because we know a lot of it of the banking piece of it but not so much of the institutional piece of the leverage, leverage loan. So I, I went to New York. I talked to like, I don't know, CLO manager, the syndicate desk. And those were people that they spoke a language very different than what you <laughs> learned in grad school. So I don't know, the book kind of like, I always thought that markets gives you a good sense of risk appetite and risk taking in the market. So I kept following the markets for, for, I don't know, for a long time now. And that book always stuck with me as a, Boy, I really don't understand what these people are saying. <laughs> Maybe another book that I like, I, I'm an avid reader, so I love The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. <laughs> I just reread it lately. This was like the 700 years from his death. And so rereading, I always found that book it gives you a good sense of like, I don't know, continuous search. You go from hell to heaven, right? So continuous search to improve. Is there a good translation for that book, an English translation or not? Or you, you presumably you read it in a... I read it in Italian. <laughs> But it's always a good symbol of like, I don't know, the evolution of your, of your life. And you're always trying to move higher, right? From lower to higher. And it was also an important point, I think, in the moving toward humanism in, in, in Europe. And so from the dark ages to different sides. So I always found that book to be, of course, you need to adjust it to, current, to the current world. But, but always, I don't know, the aspiration of, do, of doing better and moving higher. I always found that book to be quite inspiring. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I have to say you're... 
yeah, you were the first person to mention the Divine Comedy, Dante, <laughs> on this. That's great. Barbarians of the Gate and Dante. That's a good combination there. So all about the human journey and human nature. So yeah, that, that's great. And and if people wanted to follow your work or your, your division's work, where's the best place for them to search out? So I everything we put out, I, I put on my LinkedIn account. And then the IMF has its own LinkedIn account, particularly the Monitoring Capital Markets Department, where we put out all major products that we produce including the gfsr but beyond the gfsr i try to use my own account to uh advertise the work that we do as well okay great i'll, I'll include links to that in the show notes so yeah so so with that thanks a lot for this excellent and, and wide-ranging conversation it's, it's been a great pleasure to speak to you no, thank you so much thanks for having me i really appreciate it thanks for listening to the episode please subscribe to the podcast show on apple spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts leave a five-star rating and a nice comment and let other people know about the show we'd be super grateful and then sign up to become a member of macrohive at macrohive.com and we'll be back soon so tune in there